Hello and welcome to Who Does Rolls TV. I am your host, Mike B. Uh, today I'm going to look at a list of my Grail games. Everyone else, collectors, any collectors, will have Grail items in their collection. Stuff that long sought after item. Uh, and I've had a few of them. It, it is a thing that comes with a hobby. If you're collecting something, there's always going to be stuff that you really want. Um, and it's almost part of what makes the hobby so great is that chase. It's lovely to have lots of the nice things that you want of the stuff. But that chase, that always that possibility that you can track down that item that special one that thing you want and preferably possibly even greatly wonderfully would be if you can get it cheaper than it should be um that's a, that's like a real a drilling and wash, rush moment um you know and i've been involved in that i've collected a lot of stuff i've collected comic books huge swathes of them and you know the rooting through the back issues and finding that batman 468 or whatever uh you know introduction of harley quinn or whatever nonsense it would be that nothing beats that sort of moment as a collector finding that that gem um and ball games um lend themselves very well to that as well um even more so to a certain extent uh because they go out of print there is some stuff that just goes out of print and then it really the chase is on the hunt is on can we find it um so I am going to uh, give them a list of no apparent no, or even really order at all, um, which will run through 10 Grail games for me, stuff that I've got on my list um, and, you know, a little bit about them and, and, and why it's there, um, if possible. Maybe I'll just say it's there. Uh, but yes, 10 board games, my grail games that I'm always, when I'm out at the convention looking at the bringing buys or in a charity shop or car boot or anywhere, Always on the off chance, the possibility that this little gem will appear and I can pick one up. Great if it happens. We all know that rush. We all love that excitement. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive into that. Kingdom Death Monster. Um, it is an epic, giant Kickstarter game. Ooh, there's a box. Giant, massive components. Loads of detailed miniatures, which you can build in various formats. There's, it's expensive. Um, I think the base game is even going to run you a couple of hundred at this point in time. Probably an all-in buy-in to the whole bloody lot is probably in the thousands at this point. Um, it is a big, lumbering, kickstarter exclusive game. The sort of game, a bit like Gloomhaven, um, exactly like Gloomhaven, in fact, that would never be published in the real world. Um, the Kickstarter, and this is one of the gems of why Kickstarter, when it does work, how great it is to produce something like this. It's a passion project for someone... Fans adore it. It's out there. It's this monstrously huge, overblown production. But there's something a bit charming about that. Um, so yeah, Kingdom Death Monsters on there. I don't think it's one I'll ever really play. I don't think it's one I'd definitely ever own. I can't imagine. Um, but it's on there because I would like to play it. I would, even if the once it would be nice to play it. And then you go, do I want to play it? Because you might play it and then go, oh shit, this is really good. And then have to hunt it down even more so. Um, well, such as the such as the hard life of collecting stuff. Um, but yeah, Kingdom Death Monster. Um, it, it's overblown. It's huge. It's epic. It's on here. Glory to Rome. Ah, yes, Glory to Rome. Probably appearing on a great many Grail lists. Um, it's as we can't really cover Glory to Rome without possibly covering its back history. But essentially, Glory to Rome is from the designer Carl Judic. It is uh, a card-based game, purely card-based, and it's kind of an engine builder. Um, using lots of uh, uh, trademark is uh, multi-use cards. So you're building this kind of engine and this uh, thing going on and the cards all different, different things depending how you play them, how you play them out. It's a, a simple game, but not. He's really good at uh, like an economy of parts, but producing these really thinky games. Another one comes to mind as Impulse, um, another one of his, but I mean, I think Innovation's one of Chudik's ones. Just games that kind of take a minimal amount of components and kind of really get a full meat out of that by doing everything possible with what those cards or things are doing. Um, really good stuff, um, but real kind of all oh, heady scratchy. Anyway, uh, Glory to Rome. The reason probably why it appears on so many of these lists is, is it is really fucking hard to get hold of. Published by Cambridge Game Factory, I believe that's what it was. Anyway, um, uh, it was back in the 90s around then. It came out originally in a format of this kind of not shunkly art on it. Not great. It looked great, but the, it was saved by the fact that the game was really solid. Um, been around for a little while, so they decided to uh, reprint it in the black box edition, this kind of swish, nice edition, like really streamlined graphics i think it's um hiker i'm gonna hiker, i 
I can't remember the list of them that the um, uh, graphic designer's name. He was involved in picture art as well. Anyway, really quite simplistic economy of design, really just nice sort of aesthetically look. They were going to do that, publish it, do it, bof, like this. And the guy running from Cambridge, um, Cambridge Game Company, factory uh, just totally just totally went into kickstarter early days of kickstarter um and went in really blind um with just very little clue of what he was doing and systematically completely cocked it up um lost the second house during this process i know that, that a lot of the stuff was palletized up um and it didn't take the weight and was squashed so yeah it just essentially what should have happened and what should have gone out it, it ended up going to retail before it went to backers some not all backers got it i'm pretty certain um it was available retail for like 25 quid um and then blink and you miss it it's gone um forever um there's a massive falling out between the designer um and cambridge games factory uh, whoever owns the rights, I think it's them. Uh, said they basically left the industry. They're out of it. They're done, um, and they're never gonna. And they've just basically buried the rights. Really, they're not willing to even participate in a discussion of potentially of bringing it back out. Um, so at the moment in time, it is looking like pretty much Global Rome is gone in regards to any official retail release. Now, all is not lost. Number one, we got um, from Asmadi brought out uh, Motonai by Chodic. This is essentially uh, the kind of spiritual successor to Glory to Rome. Rome. It's not Glory to Rome, but it's doing an awful lot of what Glory to Rome did. Um, it's as close as you're going to get buying it off the shelf at this point in time for, well, having to mortgage your house. Um, but it's not Glory to Rome. And I've got it and I've played it a couple of times and it's doing some really whiz bangy cool stuff. The rule book is not great, um, but my issue is it's not glory to rome it's not the game i want um so the search continues now annoyingly of course i've just i filmed this segment and i've refilmed this segment because literally in the last week while i've been editing this video two glory of rome's two not the black box edition but just the basic standard cambridge games factory versions that have been out and gone off of facebook groups whilst this video video editing's been going on i missed it again I will keep an eye out for it. I would love the Black Box Edition. I know there's print-to-play versions of it. I think it's a White Box Edition that we called, which does look sweet, and it's a bit of a monumental effort to produce it. Maybe, maybe in my retirement. <laughs> maybe then I'll sit down and glue and paste and stick that all together. But for the time being, it's on the list. It is probably the most graily grail game you could think of, probably, to throw in there. But, you know, to, to find it, it's not unachievable. It's not unachievable. So I'm going to keep watching the skies, and we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Um, next up is World of Warcraft, the board game. This was brought out by um, FFG, I'll say, I'll say 10 years ago. I don't know. It, it was one of their early big coffin box games um, when they had the Blizzard license. Um, and there was two subsequent expansions for it. Uh, it was this giant, sprawling... FFG game, like they used to produce back in the oldie weldy days, things like Twilight Imperium, those big sort of big box extravagant things, it would now cost probably about 500 quid to produce that game now, <laughs> with the amount of plastic and stuff in it. Um, and it, it evokes the Warcraft world. I, for a period of time, um, a good three to four years, was embroiled in World of Warcraft before an intervention was staged. And I found myself fishing for a day. Uh, and I was like, what the hell am I doing with my fucking self? Um, but yes, Warcraft had that crank-like addiction. We played it for a good few... Burning Crusade, we played through the... Um, the uh the niche king uh, content and kind of petered out as it went after that so we were really in love with it and the idea of a board game that evokes even some of that idea of the party in the world and the different races and fighting the bosses and going on quests which it kind of did um it means it's something that just purely to evoke that period of my life when i was wasting it sat in front of a computer i could do it wasted in front of a board game big epic stupid board game with rules that will take a week to understand um so yeah it's on there uh it does pop up i see it occasionally um it seems to have gone back up in price recently i think because i think there's been a resurgence of people wanting interest in it um but i have seen it it's tantalizingly come close a couple of times i've seen it at bring and buys and things at not unreasonable prices so it's one that's on the list but i really want the expansions with it you know what i mean um so maybe one day um uh, but that's the one walk off ball game but ffg is another one on the old list 
Next up is a bit of a weirdy one. It's the McDonald's game. I think it came out from possibly Parker and Mattel back in the 70s, late 70s. Um, it was featured on Flip the Table. If you've ever listened to the Flip the Table podcast, if you've not, well, they've since stopped the podcast, but the episodes that are out there are still worth tracking down. They have some truly amazingly great episodes, really good entertainment. This podcast goes great. One of the top podcasts. Um, it's a shame not producing anymore, but the, the, what they produced was gold. Features in one of these was the McDonald's game. Um, and it's it's it really sounds cool. Um, it, it's, you're essentially making orders during the game. That's what you're trying to do to score points. There's a, there's a marble tower. You put marbles down, which tells you what you can or can't produce you're producing orders scoring points it's got lots of real great toy value um and you know just cool little funky components in it it is crying out for a reprint and when we see the likes of restoration games out there reprinting some of these classics you know you've got to secretly hope against hope that maybe maybe um they can do this with the mcdonald's game guess license is the issue but i mean it could be rethemed to a point to another burger joint i wouldn't be too put out by that but yeah the McDonald's game. Uh, there you go. That's one. Keep an eye out. Uh, <clears throat> Next up is one, well, because why wouldn't you, is War of the Ring Collector's Edition. Uh, War of the Ring is a game which essentially charts the full Lord of the Rings story. Um, one person plays as Sauron and the bad guys trying to hunt the ring down and do all sorts of nasty stuff and battles and things. Um, and then the other side is the good guys trying to protect Frodo, the ring bearer, um, trying to get him to Mount Doom and all the sort of peripheral nonsense and trees and things and probably even Tom Bombadil um, chucked into there in this big epic storytelling game. Um, now, I have got Rebellion, which is essentially the Star Wars version of, of War of the Ring. And it's a lot of fun. Um, I love Lord of the Rings. And, you know, I thought Jackson's movies were great. I've read the book many times. So the idea of uh, uh, spending an evening just creating that world, that, that story, um, and, in, and, and just embroiling yourself in it, um, it's very tempting. Now, it is able to be picked up at a more reasonable price. I know there's like kind of, I'd say mass market versions of it. So there, it is out there. It's not out of print. It is out there. It is purchasable. Um, but I've always been tempted by that big, ridiculously opulent collector's edition, which of course isn't in print anymore and is hard to get. And of course, it's ridiculously expensive. Well, we'll see. I mean, worst case, one day, maybe I'll pick up the uh, slightly cheaper version uh, just to get a tantalizing taste of it. We'll see. But there's another one on the list uh, there. Next up is a few that kind of uh, fudge the areas because they may be coming back out. This is the joy of the board game world as the stuff gets reprinted. So one is Aliens the board game. This is the biggest regret because I owned this game. Aliens the board game from Leading Edge Games. Uh, published in about the 90s uh, by today's standards. Kind of rudimentary but I remember the, all the characters were like tear out perforated bits of cardboard didn't matter what it essentially did with the expansion and i picked up all the the miniatures they produced for it i had the whole thing um uh, it played basically as the uh, the aliens movie um through as a ball game of you controlling the marines and the aliens would come up and attack you and you'd go through scenarios to complete the story essentially of aliens the movie in in a couple of sittings or in one sitting if you wanted to play solo and it played very well solo i remember as a teenage boy owning this um and playing this on my own at home and loving it um and it was a, a, you know maybe it's nostalgia maybe it's the gray misty areas of the brain cells but it's it's one i really enjoyed um, now we've had Grey Force 9 have published um, another day with the core, which I have, um, and it does a little bit of what Leading Edge's Aliens game was doing. Um, it does kind of follow the plot of the story, and you've got some of that feeling of that in there, but it kind of clutters it up with some rules and some other stuff that's not necessary, and, and it's one I've not really fully got to the table and enjoyed, so we'll see. Um, but there was something about the lean nature of this game and, the, and how it just captured that roll, you know, roller coaster sort of panicky run try and survive and the odds being constantly stacked against you it did it really well with really minimal setup um and, and a simplistic rule set but was hugely enjoyable um i know there's i think the tabletop simulator version of it somewhere and i think there's like a, a browser version of it but it's the same um it's a biggest regret because i sold it all um and i sold it all for and sun number one was just emerging into the world um, and we needed the money and it paid for a cot which I still have um, god damn it but if I still had that it'd be worth I could buy a few cots if I still had the set I had but it happened so I'm always on the lookout possibly it's not one I desperately need but it would be one nice to have back 
um, after letting it go all those years ago. Next up um, is the Dark Tower. Um, now this came out originally, I think in the 80s, it was a big plastic tower in the middle of the thing that was controlled by a squawk box. You were trying to get to the center of the tower. It's a mass market game, big opulent mass market game of which we don't see anymore because plastic costs a fortune to make and producing these things now costs a lot of money. So it's a thing of a bygone age. Um, I remember playing it once many, 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 many years ago and just being blown away because possibly of just what it was doing. But it was something about it. It was doing quite entertainingly well, even with its rudimentary technology. Obviously, we are in the modern age now and Dark Tower has been kickstarted. Um, restoration games have evolved. They brought in Isaac Childress, the guy behind uh, Gloomhaven, and it's been polished up and produced. And now I've seen uh, some video and some footage of this tower as now this feat of engineering that's moving around and talking and doing all sorts of crazy shit. Um, I never backed the Kickstarter because it got expensive. It really did. Um, and at the time, I think I was maybe on the cusp of between jobs and stuff. It was an expense that I couldn't really, in all good faith, throw out and do. Um, but it's now it's out there. It's coming. It's not been released yet. Um, so maybe down the road, potentially, it's one of those that I'm like, oh, um, it is there. It's a tantalizing possibility. It's the Dark Tower, um, which is obviously returning to us oh, maybe this year, I think. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how much self-control I can use and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Another one on there is uh, a great one from Eric Lang is um, Chaos in the Old World. Um, came from FFG um, again about 10 or so years ago. Um, it was during the period of time when they had the rights to the Games Workshop games, um, the universe. So they produced Forbidden Stars, which I'm sure is on many people's ground lists and it's a fantastic game. Um, but early, early on was Chaos in the Old World with his expansion with Andy the Skaven. Um, and it's essentially dudes on a map, area control thing. It was kind of now looking at it, it is very much sort of like the the meat and gristle of a lot of Lang's subsequent other games, especially the a lot of the stuff he's done with Call Mini, um, like Blood Rage, um, it's probably its closest sort of companion piece, but all of that sort of range of stuff he's done, um, those area control games of, of, of you controlling areas and, and having modular powers. Um, there's something about it, just that board that's made to look like skin stretched over a thing, it's kind of that kind of cool sort of heavy metalish games workshop chaos feel to it um and i've played it and it's a great game um and it's one of those thinky games that you can kind of really enjoy the ameritrash sort of rah, plasticky goodness of it but also that deep underlying strategy in there and it's one of lang's games that i always regret not picking up when i had the opportunity and i did uh, but you don't, you know, you're young and just in day, stepping out in the early days of your collection and, oh, you know, you don't want to just, just buy any old thing. Um, but yeah, there we go. Chaos in the Old World. It is out there. Um, obviously, sadly, maybe, I hope against hope, seeing so much stuff has been republished by WizKids have done uh, Fury of the Dragon and that. You do wonder if, if we may see a Chaos in the Old World reprint. I'm stunned that they've not done it if they could have the opportunity. So maybe it's possible. Oh, I'll just keep looking out. There's big and buy sales. Could be expensive. Um, Chaos in the World from Eric Lang. Last couple of ones in here. So there's Discworld, Ankhmore Pork, um, which, you know, uh, Martin Wallace, um, I love the Discworld books. I've read a great many of them. There's still some I haven't read, and I'm in no rush to buy or pick them up or read them because it's always nice to stumble across one of those. And uh, now that dear, dear Terry Pratchett is no longer with us, God bless him, um, it's, it, he's not producing any more books. So I'm not in a rush to finish them all. I think so often I might stumble across one and I'll be like, I've not read that. And it's nice. It means there's always new Pratchett's out there for me when I get around to bothering to find them. But Angmore Pork um, and, the, and the Discworld World and all that, oh, just great. I love those books. And this is a game that does a really good job of taking that theme and, and into a great mind while it's designed. Um, it is out of print. Um, they lost the rights and licenses to it. It's subsequently be reprinted as Nanty Narkin. But it hasn't got Ank, it hasn't got that Mark Warfog hasn't got that Discworld theme on it. Kind of, I lose interest, and it's one I, I would love to play. Never played it, seen it, but never played it. Tony has this sealed because they picked it up, I think, from a free cycle sale, like the, the swine. But he won't open it. Won't let us play it. So maybe one day. Uh, but it's definitely one on my ground list. I would love to play it. I'd love to own it at some point. Um, maybe who knows? Probably unlikely now. It's costs for it to, again. A, up 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 but never say never 
Finally on here is actually one which I kind of, because I, I did this list and then I was kind of struggling towards the end of it actually, of the, of the ones I picked and of like just throwing something in because it was a name, but actually I wanted it to at least mean something or something that I've kind of got that, oh I need to pick up. Um, and it's a more recent one, um, it's Abomination um, Hair of Frankenstein, it's from Plant Hat Games. Um, and this was in fairly plentiful supply up to about for, for the tail end of last year. And it was one that had been on my radar, I like the look of it, I like the idea of you building a Frankenstein's monster. That's gothic -y horror feel to it. I, I've always liked that sort of stuff. And there's been a couple of games that have kind of toyed in that universe, but never really kind of caught it for me, that real feel. This looks like it does. It's a worker placement game. It's got this sort of macabre theming to it. It looks kind of cool. Your body snatching, you're building monsters. Um, it's all kind of sounds good stuff. Then Plaid Hat split from Asmodee, gone their own way. And so this has not been reprinted. Um, now, it deals, does still sit with Plant Hat. They have it. It is in their catalogue. Um, but obviously, clearly now at this point in time, they are not the big studio they were. So they're going to have to kind of get around to this stuff if they can. And they're currently kind of doubling down on the um, the reprints or the re reimagining of Ashes, which was a great card deck building game. I didn't own it all, but I had some of it and it was really good. So anyway, all of that out of the way. Um, and the Abomination, Herod Frankenstein, it, it's a game that could potentially see a reprint, one hopes, at some point down the road, in which case I will patiently wait for that day. Um, or, you know, it may well pop up, um, because it's it's not that well thought of. It's it's definitely one, a curio for us fans of that feel of stuff. So, you know, I may well track it down. Um, it's one I'm on the feeders out for. It's one that's popped more recently into my brain, and I have a look, and it's not around available. So it's there. It's, it's nice to have something that's maybe, maybe achievable. I can wait. I'm a patient man. Um, so there you go. There are my top... 10 or my 10 grail games that are currently on my list of stuff that I'd love to find. Um, what are your grail games? Have you got any? What am I talking about? Who knows? But I've been Mike B, this has been Who Does Rolls TV, and there has been another video of a list of stuff uh, because we're not playing very much. <laughs> Until next time, ta-ta, bye-bye, have fun and stay safe. Cheers!